This is part of a series of three videos on resilient modulus testing. The other two videos are a discussion of whether now is the time to get into resilient modulus testing and an overview of the resilient modulus startup process. The startup video includes a definition of resilient modulus and explains the test equipment setup. In this video, we'll walk you through the processes of resilient modulus sample preparation and testing. The information presented here is based on the Federal Highway Administration's Protocol P46, resilient modulus of unbound granular base sub-base materials and subgrade soils. P46 and this video were developed as part of the long-term pavement performance program. First, we'll cover sample preparation. Protocol P46 greatly simplifies the diversity among the materials you'll be testing. It divides them all into two types, which it refers to as type 1 and type 2. There are detailed specifications in P46 for both types, but in summary, type 1 is coarse-grained and type 2 is fine-grained. There are several things you need to do before you actually mold either type of sample for testing. First, you need to establish moisture and density target values based either on your own proctor test or on a predetermined value provided with the sample. Next, sieve the sample. If less than 10% of the material is oversized, discard the large material. P46 defines oversized for type 1 and type 2. If more than 10% of the material is oversized, P46 is not applicable and the resilient modulus will have to be determined in some other way. Now mix the remaining material until it's relatively uniform, adding water to achieve the target moisture content. Then weigh the material. For a type 1 sample, you may now go right ahead with the procedure, or you may let the material stand for a maximum of two days. But for type 2 samples, it's important to be sure moisture is evenly distributed throughout the material, so you must allow type 2 samples to stand at least overnight, but no longer than two days. If you do let the material stand, weigh it again when you remove it from storage. Then you're ready to mold a specimen for testing. Whether you're preparing a type 1 or type 2 specimen, the specimen must be a cylinder whose height is twice its diameter. Use a split mold to prepare a type 1 specimen. Place a rubber membrane into the mold and put the mold in a vibratory compactor. Apply a vacuum. Build the specimen from the bottom up in six equal lifts to achieve the target density. Use the static loading method to prepare a type 2 specimen. Working from the center of the mold, build the specimen in five lifts. First build toward one end. Then flip the specimen and build toward the other end, being sure to compact each lift correctly. P46 states that all specimens must be tested within five days of being molded. If you are going to store the specimen before testing, weigh it before and after storage to determine if there is any moisture loss. If moisture loss during storage is more than 1%, you must discard the specimen, but you may reuse its material to make a new specimen. Remember that in preparing all test specimens, your goal is to achieve the target moisture and density values. The next part of the process after molding is to prepare the specimen and the apparatus for testing. The procedure here is similar for type 1 and type 2 specimens and for base, sub-base, or sub-grade materials. In the following scenes, we'll show a type 2 specimen, that is, one for which no membrane was used in molding. First, place a dry porous stone disc on the bottom platen and lay a paper filter on top of the stone. Then place the specimen on the filter paper. Expand a membrane with a vacuum expander and carefully place the membrane over the specimen. Then release the vacuum and remove the expander. Seal the membrane to the bottom platen with an O-ring. Next, put a paper filter on top of the specimen and a second porous stone disc on top of the paper filter. Then fold the membrane up and seal it to the top platen with a second O-ring. Check to be sure the top platen is level. The next step is to check for leaks in the sealed specimen assembly. To do that, connect the bottom drainage line to a vacuum source through a bubble chamber. 
your goal is zero bubbles. If there are bubbles, check for leakage caused by poor connections, holes in the membrane, or imperfect O-ring seals. You may be able to eliminate leakage by coating the membrane with liquid rubber latex or by using a second membrane. When you've eliminated leakage, disconnect the vacuum supply. Place the transparent cylinder chamber on the triaxial cell base plate and place the cover plate with the attached loading piston on the chamber. Tighten the chamber tie rods and check to be sure the cover plate is level. Then slide the assembly into position under the axial loading device. During loading, it's critical to achieve vertical alignment. Finally, fasten the triaxial chamber to the load frame base plate and check the top of the chamber to be sure it's level. When the specimen, the test chamber, and all other equipment are correctly assembled and connected, you're ready for the next part of the process, a series of loading cycles that will condition the specimen. P46 specifies 500 to 1,000 repetitions, details on the confining pressure and the magnitude and waveform of the load pulses are in P46. There are three reasons for running these conditioning loadings. First, you need to achieve the best possible contact and seating between the many components under load. Second, you monitor the two LVDTs to be sure they're being displaced similar distances. If the displacements do not meet the specification in P46, it usually means there's some misalignment of the system, which you must investigate and correct before continuing. And third, you run the conditioning to determine if the test specimen was correctly compacted during preparation. P46 suggests that a permanent vertical strain of 5% or more during conditioning may mean the specimen was inadequately compacted. If you do record that much strain, you must stop the test, investigate the preparation process, and remold the specimen. After conditioning, you're ready to run the resilient modulus test itself. The test on each specimen consists of up to 15 loading sequences. In each loading sequence, you run 100 cycles with varying axial stresses and confining pressures. Each cycle consists of a haversine-shaped pulse for a tenth of a second, followed by a rest period of nine-tenths of a second. If the permanent vertical strain caused by the actual test, that is, not including strain caused by the conditioning sequence, exceeds 5% at any time during the test, you must stop the test, reduce the confining pressure to zero, remove the specimen, conduct a moisture content test, and report the results. If there's less than 5% vertical strain, you go to the next part of the process, a quick shear test. To run this test, apply the confining pressure specified in P46 and advance the top platen so it produces a 1% per minute strain on the specimen. Continue until one of three things happens. Either the load values decrease with increasing strain, or 5% strain is reached from the beginning of the shear test, or the capacity of the load cell is reached. In some cases, the stress-strain curves level out and do not increase with increasing strain. If a specimen appears to fail without achieving any of these criteria, you include a comment on this on the reporting sheet. When you finish the quick shear, you've completed testing the specimen. So reduce the confining pressure to zero, remove the specimen from the chamber, and remove the membrane. Then determine the moisture content of the entire specimen. After testing, you calculate resilient modulus values for the material you've tested. The sequence of calculations is shown on a standardized worksheet that's included in P46. To do the calculations, you use data from only the last five loading cycles out of each set of 100 pulses. You end up with a resilient modulus value for each combination of confining pressure and load. Each of these resilient modulus values corresponds with a specific combination of vehicle loading and soil depth. We've covered a lot of ground here, so let's review the major steps in the resilient modulus testing process. Before molding a specimen, you establish the moisture content of the material. Sieve the sample and discard the large material. Then you mix and add water to achieve a target moisture content and weigh the material. For type 1 material, you now go on to the molding process. For type 2 material, 
you let the material stand to distribute moisture and weigh it again after storage. There are different molding procedures for type 1 and type 2 materials. For type 1, you use a split mold and a vibratory compactor. For type 2, you use the static loading method. After molding, you place the specimen in the triaxial test chamber and check for leaks. You run conditioning loadings to seat the sample, check the alignment of the test equipment, and determine if the specimen is suitable for testing. You run the resilient modulus test, which consists of a sequence of pulses at various confining pressures and loading values. Then you run a quick shear test. Finally, you calculate the resilient modulus value for each combination of confining pressure and loading. As you can see, resilient modulus testing is complex and exacting. Doing it right requires both skill and knowledge. It takes a while to become proficient. You can be proud of your accomplishment.